Yeah. Remember, God, oh, man, you supposed to be recording. Yeah, I cancel that. That's uncool. I'm Terry Blues, and I want to welcome you to Black Gift TV. Make sure you subscribe to the channel by clicking the icon below. Black Gift TV is your one-stop shop for colored content. It is the official channel for the Four Color Man podcast and the Dean's List streaming series. You also find music, stand-up comedy, and short film works. And if you like the content, make sure you visit www.blackgiftcreative.com, the official sponsor for the Four Color Man podcast merch. Black Gift is the brand that reps for the creatives of color. Whether you're an artist, educator or entrepreneur black gift is the brand that reps for you let's change the black nerd narrative and embrace our gifts and let this generation know it's cool to be smart now let's start the show you are now about to witness the strength of street knowledge yo you know what it is welcome back and thank you for listening you're tuned in to the four colored man podcast with your host terry blues now i got a special guest in here with with me today uh, my good friend, you know, and 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 formerly other black guy. <laughs> <laughs> my, my good friend, artist, uh, extraordinaire, uh, Spencer Evans. You know what I mean? What's going on, man? What's, what's going on, man? What's going on? It's good to be here, man. Thanks for having your boy on, man. <laughs> yeah, Yo, man, I really appreciate you coming on, man. And, and, well, and like I always say, uh, and like I said, when I was on with Ken, like the, the group text that we have together was my inspiration for doing this podcast, man. Cause yeah. that should be wild, man. Like, yo, oh. <laughs> it gets really deep though. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we get, you get some of everything in there. Yo, so I, 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 I'm thankful that you got a chance to come on. Cause I, I, I you know, really want to get into some things with you because you, you know, it's funny. So quick story, right? Before yeah. I let you run down your resume. Yeah. So me and Spencer went to went to graduate school together, went to art school together. Uh, I was in the yeah. film program, he was in the art program. But, you know, occasionally we hit the gym. Uh, we would hit the gym together on occasion, but, like, sometimes we'll, I'll, like, I'll be leaving or I'll, I'll be coming in as he's leaving or vice versa or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I remember one day, I, I don't remember if, if you were coming in and I was leaving or vice versa. Yeah. But I remember we sat there and we talked. Yeah. And by the time we realized it had been like two, three hours, nigga, Straight up. nigga missed the whole workout. <laughs> the whole workout was a sta standing in the same area. You know what? I think I was on the way out, bro. I think I was on the way out. You was on the way in. And we looked down like, damn, bro. That was like, my bad, bro. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I done hijacked your whole afternoon in this song, man. <laughs> Yo, nah, but it's cool, man, because I always, you know, whether I'm whether I'm uh, you know, building my body or my mind, I I like I said with kidding, man, like I enjoy those like really end up conversations. I really get to have them, man. So I really enjoy them. Yeah. You know well, what it was definitely it was a testament to like what we needed. It was something that we weren't getting enough and then you could tell we needed because every time we linked up whether it was just you and me or it was all four of us you me uh kenton and uh and, and yaki well we'll sit and just talk for hours and just fully unload on like like on a whole lot of things that that probably we had encountered or something we were thinking about but due to like the population of shit art school and then school period we rarely got the opportunity to really speak like candidly about it. And so you, you could just tell, like it was, it was just, we were having like honest conversations that it was just like, bro, we had to get into that. Yeah. 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 And we'll get, we'll get into a little bit of that later, man. Cause I really want to get into some things with you. Yeah. But before yeah. we get into that, man, let me, um, let, let me give you a proper introduction. I'm gonna let you run down your own resume. Cause you, you could do it better. Oh, but let me sure. tell you something, man. Like, yo, not only is my man a dope artist, oh, come on, right. what I enjoyed about grad school, man, I was surrounded by some hard working brothers. <laughs> like, 
Yaki, I've worked under him and worked with him and like yeah. tried to match his work ethic. And that's yeah. just mad difficult. And yeah. I see you like, yo, but I yeah. know for a fact, like you was in that bitch daily painting, uh, yo, getting into all these exhibitions, like getting your work seen with these, you know, uh, fellows, all these things, man. Like, and and it, it is funny because we talked about before some of your motivations and what made you work harder. But yo, that's mm-hmm. what I really admire was like, yo, because even when I was talking to Josh and Sydney, I was like, yo, we were talking about like the other art school people. They'd be like, yo, we we work hard, but like, yo, I say outside of that, like, yo, Spencer, that motherfucker is work, nigga. Like, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so with that being said, man, go ahead. Introduce yourself to the people, you know, let them know what you're about, where you what you're working with, what you done done. All right, that's a bet. Um, all right, so say, say a little bit about myself from Houston, Texas, born and raised. I uh, come from a, a, a background of, of education. Well, my mother worked in oil and gas, uh, but my dad was in education, so I, I, I value, I always value that, uh, highly. Um, always was in the art, but, uh, just as my title or like who I am and who I've been in the past, uh, few years, um, masters in fine arts, uh, got my BFA from university of Missouri, double major in drawing and painting. And, um, my work is centered in, you know, it, it comes from my experience as, as a black man who, essentially is like on a journey of finding his, his true self and presenting that. And the challenge within that is trying to present that to everyone with whom he comes in contact. And, uh, that sounds more simple than than one would think, but there's an issue that I used to have that, you know, most of us have with, that has to do with, um, hiding certain things. Yeah. Not just, and so so that's been my thing. And so because of that, my research is based in an image and identity within a black community, uh, specifically to talk about this idea of changing oneself and and uh and transforming yourself in different ways. Uh so that's led me uh to doing this research with, with black Americans, of course. But uh, I was I was blessed to be able to travel to Nigeria and five states therein to to extend that that conversation there because my lineage is is Nigerian and, uh, and Cameroonian, and so uh, I felt like that was a that was a way of of getting the whole side of it when it comes to my own experience because I, I believe all problem solving is connected to its origin. So I think of like myself and uh, where, where things come from. And because of that, I was able to travel to um, uh, Sudan within the same uh, 12 months. And that, but that was in a project that was connected with the embassy. And uh, so that was, I was just blessed to hit the, hit the continent twice, man. And uh, it's really blossomed uh, my, my research and my outlook on everything to the point where I see it on a micro level as well as a, as a macro level when it comes to this idea of interconnectivity. So my work has a lot to do with finding those connections of like knowing your true self and then finding how you connect with everyone around you. Yo, man. You know, and I'm also a professor at UTA right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I throw that in there. Yeah, we out here working, baby. Throw that in there right black, there, yeah. black men in higher education, that's what we do this for. Straight up. Straight I, like up. To call this, I like to call this edutainment. You know what I mean? I, I, I want to give you a lesson, but I'm going to give you some jokes as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh-huh. Either way, you get hit with both sides. <laughs> that, that's where we at, baby. You got you to put, uh, put the medicine in the candy. Already. But, but I'm glad you talked about that, man, because I... Uh, well, you mentioned the, the going to Africa thing, right? Because yes. I really want to get into it with you about that. But I, I got want to start off first uh, uh, with where you actually start. Well, I, the Africa thing is really interesting to me because I want to get your perspective on that as yeah. far as like your 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 encounters, your interactions, your whole experience and, and how that changed you. And I and I know witnessing your art that it did have a major influence on that. But before yes, we get did. into that, man, like I want to get into like your beginnings, right? Like and you and you said 
and this was interesting. You said your, your dad was in um, education. Was he like a high school teacher, professor? What level did he teach at? And, uh, he was, so he went through kind of the whole gamut, really. He started out as a teacher. Mm hmm and then uh, actually started out as a, he started out coaching in, in, in middle school mm -hmm. and then he became a teacher and then he, he worked his way up. And that's, you know, the, the power of a, of a strong black woman that, to, that will have her man wanting more. And so um, my mom was like, why don't you go ahead and, and, and try to do more? This is your thing. So um, he went and got his master's and then uh, eventually got his doctorate and became a he worked in administration. He was an assistant principal, then became a principal, then became the executive principal over um, about four or five schools at the same time. And mm -hmm. then he uh, he retired for a hot second. But you is, you know, you know, most brothers have to retire like twice. And so <laughs> <laughs> he came back like Jordan wearing the faux file. <laughs> so he came back and was working for uh, for TEA as a as an educational consultant. So he was. Um, um, it was. It's almost. Uh, it's like comparable to being a venture capitalist for schools, like showing them how to to perform better. And so I got to see like the whole side of it from him being in education. But the thing that was so cool about him, which made it stick to me so tough, he didn't try to force his experience onto onto my brothers and me. Uh -huh. It was. It was more so of just having us around the things that, that, that come with education. And it's like, if it sticks, then it's never going to leave, but I'm not going to force it on you. So he would always bring us to certain events and he would bring us to, to things that like, there'd be a conference that he had. I remember one time specifically he had, there was a conference he was sent to in uh, Florida and uh, he and my mom paid for us to go to Florida with him. Uh -huh. And so it was just when he had to sit in some of the things just so just so we could see kind of like the effects and the ins and outs. And so it it stuck with all of us, but it really stuck with me in a sense, because I it became a passion that I didn't know I had other than art. That is the only passion that, that rivals my passion for making things and, and finding a way to connect with people is connecting with people through education and giving them something that no one else can take away. Oh man, yo, that's that shit is deep. And that's interesting, right? Because it's funny you say that because like um right. and it's funny because like with me and my kids, like like you said, like like I don't think college is for everybody, right? Like right. I, I want you I to agree. find your passion and, and be able to make a living off that. And whatever yeah. path that needs to be that you to get there, I'm cool with that. But yeah. like me being in higher education, uh, you know, you, their mom has a master's degree. You know, I have one. And when mm -hmm. I was teaching or anything that I had at school or like any chance that I got, I would bring them with me. I bring them to school with me if I have class, if I'm yeah. teaching or if I got, you know, and not be, for two reasons. One, because like you said, I want them to experience that. Right. Yeah. Like I want them to be around that. Like you grow up yeah. knowing that then it's not foreign to you as you get older. One. And then two, I kind of want them to be like, oh, yo, my dad's a pretty smart guy or my dad. Like he's doing something like, yeah. you know what I mean? Try to like because I know what they mama say about me. So, yeah, it kind of is. Yeah. What it is. <laughs> your, your dad is not a dead be out in these streets. I promise uh, you. Right. <laughs> But but I'm glad you said that because it makes me feel good that maybe that will stick with them. Like like yeah. how you said, going to those things with your daddy, you just seeing him work and yeah. do those things like, yo, that's kind of influenced me. Yeah, that's important, man. Yeah, which is very interesting. So like like you said, he didn't force it on you, but, right. you know, so like how many brothers you got? I have three brothers and one sister. And all of y'all are college educated, right? Yeah. All y'all got masters or like um no. My my oldest brother has a PhD mm -hmm. and then I have a master's, but everybody else kind of just went into their fields. Bet, bet, bet. But that's that's you know, that's still a high percentage, man. Your dad is shooting a high percentage. That nigga shooting like Steph Curry. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, my, yeah. My my guy's great. So we, we we made we made it through there, man. And it's uh and it is great because you talk about like generational things. Um Shit, after like my, I'm not my. Let me see. Did my did my grandparents go? So on my dad's side, 
I'm not sure if my my paternal grandfather went to college, and uh, I think my uh, my my dad's mom went to college, but but before before him, it just that shit was not a high percentage like that at all. Like out of out of my brother, out of my dad's, because <laughs> it's six of them. Like um, out of my dad's uh, siblings, it's, it's six of them, all all dudes, and um, out of them. My my dad and shit. I think one other, well, only one other of them had finished, and he was he was in education too. He was a teacher, but he just he just stayed a teacher and and, uh, and retired that way. But like it was just him, and then um, with my mom. So my mom went to college. She just she got a bachelor's and then worked it. Oil and gas was booming when she got out of college, so she went straight in. So she was good with a, a biology degree. Uh, but it was just and and like you said, it's it's not a thing that's like if you go back, you you can find you can find like when it comes to the black community, like for the most part, you can find where where that stops. You yeah. go back, you go back a couple generations, and it's kind of like. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, they was just making it happen for real. Like they yeah, had it. They, yeah. they they did a trade right quick and like boom, or they went to the military and they came yeah. out and did whatever. Exactly, so, yo. Because we only about it, it went yeah. like if you think about it, we not that far out of Jim Crow where niggas was just now starting to graduate. Uh, yeah. or, or get into white schools, and then prior to that, your HBCUs and like started out as like trade schools really right like these right. teachers colleges and such so our, yeah. so our educational lineage is very easily traceable like right. you, you don't need a 23 of me for that shit so 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 for us it's like we're just now getting getting to that point um so 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 for you you got to see that early and and you already know what it is but yeah. you know a lot of us don't like you know what I mean? It, yeah. Um, so, so you said your dad is what like influenced you for the educational part, right? But where'd you get into like the the artistry as far as like being a painter in that side of it? What where was your early inspiration in that? And honestly, um, I think I think expression was just. I think exp- like creative expression was was something that that was just given to me, just like a God given thing. Um, and I think that was it was going to happen anyway, no matter what was going to go on. Because like uh, I don't tell many people this story, but now I guess I'm telling a hell of people this story. I'm not doing it right now. Yo, well, but, uh, if we, if we yo, if this shit <laughs> blow up, my nigga, like, yo, I got an exclusive. Uh, yeah, exclusive. <laughs> Exclusive, exclusive. Oh my god. So, uh, I'm gonna add the sound effects later. Yeah, throw that in there. Oh, uh, 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 Jamaican horn. DeMarco. <laughs> 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 it is time <laughs> to play. <laughs> but um uh, so when when I was this I was about um I was I was two years old. I was two years old, and uh, my younger brother was just born. Younger brother was still a baby, and probably up until I was uh, three, and a little bit after that. You you know them little, uh, you know like the mobiles, the, the thing that you crank up that's over the the yeah, like a spin that plays the music. Yeah, 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 yeah. That shit. So of course he had one of those, and um, we had this little wooden piano that was like made for kids. You know, it didn't have like that many. You know, it had probably forty keys on it. You know, uh-huh. black and white. It wasn't even it was a small piano, and uh, so I used to. This, and this is a, a story my parents told me over and over: is that I would stand up on the piano and crank the mobile for him and well they they thought i was cranking it for him because that's what my mom said she caught me doing it one time mm-hmm. i was standing up on top of the piano and i cranked it for him and, and as the music played and she said I, I got back down and sat on the floor and played the tune that was playing on the mo- mobile on the little piano and so um and you know just just from hearing it just playing by ear i was yeah. able to catch the, the melody and play that 
on a piano, like like an instrument. And so um, she was. She said she would ask me about stuff, and I, she said I would tell her all the time. I have music in my head, like a like a child telling a parent. I have music in my head. Yo, man, that's like some some Rain Man autistic genius Ray, shit. Man. Rain, Rain Man stuff, bro. <laughs> I have music in my head. Like I'm two years old. What are you What are you talking about, two year old? Yo, go, I would have. If I was your there. dad, I would have put your ass on a piano. Like, yo, right. nigga, you would have been a fucking. That's, that's and that and that's what they say is one of one of their greatest regrets. As as you know, for me as a kid, like as a young kid, was that they didn't make sure that that's what happened mm. but like i said i think expression was just supposed to come out anyway because after that i i was doing visual expression but by way and i didn't think anything of it it was just something i really enjoyed to do and of course i started when i was young when like everybody's an artist mm. so it you know it was nothing to me i just kept doing it and i did it in my free time not just when it was time to draw at school I did it in my free time. This is what I love to do. And uh, I found it as a way of like telling a story that was visual that anybody could see, no matter, you know, what language you speak, people speak the, the like visual language. And so uh, I always saw it as storytelling. So I would say I got serious about it to the point where I wanted to take the next step with it when I saw another brother that was doing it. Who is who was doing on a professional level, and this was a big thing for me because people always, and especially in the you know in the black community, but like everywhere really, people who don't understand uh, art in whatever genre will tell you that that's a hobby. Go get a you know a, a real job does this. A real job has these hours. A real job you dress like this to go there. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is this is the kind of thing. And so that is in like, that's something that we condition ourselves to think. And we tell the next generation that over and over. And so it wasn't until I met this brother that I wanted to actually pursue it. It, was, it wasn't until that until I actually knew I could because he said, oh, you know, I went to school for you go to school for this. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, it's, yeah, it's funny you say that because I was literally just if, about, about to ask you, like, what was your like? What was the influence that said like, "Oh, I could do this"? Like, let me do this, yo. And it's funny, right? Because this whole semester that I've been at work, every seminar I go to, every talk I go to, every meeting I go to, everything is about diversity and inclusion. Yeah, right. And it's and uh-huh. and, and and that's the big thing. And now especially in like like other fields right like uh-huh. like like you said like in the black community it's like nigga you better get a job yeah like you talking about you drawing pictures what yeah right nigga you better hey man <laughs> yeah you better change some oil or something straight up <laughs> you know what I mean like what are you doing with yourself you better go get a factory job get through this pension you deliver right. mail something straight up get but, your benefits yeah but that's because we don't see anything else mm-hmm. and like the the representation like seeing somebody do something that you want to do and knowing that it's possible, how important is that? Like, yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's so important and it's it's overlooked. Um she, uh my first first year of grad school, myself and uh, another one of our, our colleagues was was brought in to basically <laughs> give a consult on on diversity and inclusion. How can we get more uh, diverse applicants into the grad program or into the program period. And so they were asking one, the, the, the other person was an international student. And then, and then there was me. So they were asking her, how can we get more international students to apply? And mm-hmm. so she talked about like, um, she talked about a more accessible uh, website that tells more information on, on how they can apply. And, and, uh, and like, how do they get uh, access to paperwork and and like what all do they need to send? Just like somewhere that like gives them a, an easier way to figure it out without having to go through somebody to figure it out for them, which was great advice. You know, she because she was speaking from experience. Mm-hmm. So they were asking me, they're like, OK, so what do you think we could do to get more more black students? And I'm and I'm like, well, representation matters. I said, so if you want somebody to. 
If you want, so, if you want somebody to feel like this is a place that they should go, or at least a place they want to come to, they have to see somebody who's like them there. Yeah, because I'm gonna tell you this: when it when it came to uh, me meeting, me, and you know, I didn't even meet Cedric in person. That's my uh, for all those listening. That Cedric Huckabee is my uh, mentor and and a major professor at UTA. <laughs> And his brother's an internationally known artist that doesn't have to teach at a university. I mean, yeah, hey, 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 and for the listeners out there, let's, hey, shout out to Cedric. I fucks yeah. with Cedric. Hey, we want to get him on on the podcast too. So yeah, so That'd so yeah, let, yeah. Let's let's put that out in the air. We try to get him yeah. on. We try yeah, to get him that, on. That brother there. So um, I didn't know much about him. I didn't know I didn't know him before uh, the applying. I, I went to visit the campus when uh you know i was looking for art programs uh the second time around and so i went to visit the campus just to kind of see what was going on and i, I visited their program and everybody i was meeting kept telling they, they, they learned i was a you know i was working in painting and i was uh drawing and painting and I'm using the figure and, and the work that i do and everybody kept telling me i need to meet cedric you should meet cedric all right now spoiler alert they were because of what we do, uh, like our subject matter has to do with like things within the black community. But the other part is he's also black. So I think that's another reason why <laughs> everybody kept saying I need to meet him. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, so you need to meet Cedric. Well, hey, so that, you just I, meet that I, other black guy already. <laughs> exactly. So. Um, so I left, I left there thinking like, ah, who is it? You know, who's this guy? So I, I, I researched him and, uh, I was like, oh, this dude is cold. And I looked at all the stuff he was doing, um, across the nation and stuff that he, he had done, uh, in Europe and all this. And I was like, oh, this brother's cold. And this brother done got a, a Guggenheim. He graduated from, from Yale and he did this and he did that. I'm like, ah, oh, this dude, and he right from, he from Fort Worth. So like all this stuff that he's doing, like he has planted himself in a way that he decided to do. This brother could easily be somewhere else. Good. And so uh, this is somebody who was essentially kind of taking like control of his life in a, in a sense. And he's using his gift to do so. I'm like, man, this is cause like, hold on, bro. And so he called, they had him call. I don't know. They had him do it. They uh-huh. probably told him about me and then gave him my information. He could have called or not if he wanted to, but the brother called me the next day. And we talked for like two and a half hours. Yeah. And I and I just chopped it up. And, and from that, this was the only this was the only place I uh I applied to after that. Cause I wanted to work with him. Yo, yo. And, it, and you know what's funny, man? Like Cedric is probably the most humble, like, like that nigga don't like if you oh, meet yeah. him, he'll be like, oh, like you wouldn't easily. even know the difference. Like What'd you say that time? He's like, uh, he's like, oh man, he just sold a painting for like eighty thousand. Then he was just oh, like, yeah. oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and it wasn't, it wasn't like oh, no cocky stuff. No, yeah, it wasn't. A flip. It, was, it was just like he was, he was like, like, oh, he's like, oh, that's cool, man. Thanks for telling me. And I was like, what? <laughs> so, yeah, and, and he don't, he not flashy. He, he don't do none of that. You gonna, you just, you just gonna see how it is. you just, you just have to watch him. He ain't gonna tell you. He ain't gonna tell you about all this live stuff. You just gonna watch. He, he yeah. Let other people talk. yeah, it's funny because I think shit was kismet, right? Because when yeah. I was talking, I, you know, I was interviewing Kitten and we were talking about this, right? And, you know, I talked about like for me, my educational history has been predominantly white, right? Yeah. Like in school in the gifted and talented programs, predominantly uh-huh. white. Like, you know what I mean? Um, my, I was in the army for a minute, but then going into undergrad, that was actually predominantly Mexican, but, Uh but, uh, you know, otherwise it's like, I, you, you, you find this, I'm the only black guy kind of situations. Yeah. Right. And I thought grad school, like, yo, it was the best experience of my life because I got to experience this really interesting, and like I sometimes, you know, in my white world, my world is very white on a regular basis. Uh-huh. I get to, I get to, to immerse myself in these pockets of blackness. Yeah, <laughs> like, I fucking love it. Yeah. And then, like, so when I was in grad school, you know, meeting you, uh-huh. uh, Yaki, Kitten, fucking Cedric, like, this was the very first time in my life that I had ever experienced 
direct contact with black men that I could relate to in positions yeah. that I wanted to be in. Exactly. Right? Like, you know what exactly. I mean? And, and exactly how you said it. It's funny because our stories are very parallel into where yeah. we, how we even arrived there. Because like you said, it's like, yo, I showed up. It's like, oh, have you met Cedric? Have you met Cedric? Because it is like, oh, black guy paints. White people automatically see the parallel, right? Like, yeah. just because... Yaki and I are black and we both make movies. We could be on two whole different things. But it's funny because I came to UTA the same way. When I was in undergrad, me and Yaki went to the same undergrad and he came back for an alumni speech. And when I was in undergrad, I was doing film or doing like my own little short films or my um, screenwriting teacher knew I wanted to be uh, in film. Um, and she was one of his professors. So when yeah. he came down, she was like, oh, you got to meet Yaki. You got to meet Yaki. And she introduced me to him. We chopped it up right there. He was like, I was like, yeah, I'm looking into film school. He was like, oh, have you looked into UTA? And I was like, no, nah, I didn't even know they had a program. Yeah. He gave me his card. Um, we ended up emailing each other back and forth. Only place I applied to. And yep. within coming there, getting to work directly, with, with somebody directly who was, who I could relate to, similar backgrounds, doing what the fuck I wanted to do. I was like, yo, man, this is amazing experience. And beyond that, other black dudes that I could intellectually unload on, like how you said yep. before, to be able to have those conversations. And it really put, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you feel the same way, like put you on another level in that space. Like, yeah, yeah man. Definitely. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. And we and, and you it's something that's so needed, bro. Like it's cause we talk about community all the time. I, I I preach back and forth to my students about um needing community, especially as an artist. You know, we, we live in a society that that benefits off of off of the creativity of of artists, but then they <laughs> for some reason there's like this culture of connecting that product from the person who produced it. And so, and, and then mocking people who are creative, it's the wildest shit ever. So I talk about how, it, how healthy it is for people to have these communities. And it wasn't until I got to, to UTA and then linked up with y'all that I, I realized, you know, that even, even within that community, I needed to find uh, like the the actual pocket that would fully understand me because I learned early. I learned real quick. I learned, I learned real quick that just because um, other folks were were artists and 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 so called liberals and progressives that that they would understand me more, and that just was not the case. And I had to be around um, some more some more black folks to kind of like bent you know kind of bounce things off of because I. I you know, I didn't want to spend so much time teaching people who, you know, who how not no. to act with me. It's yeah, just yeah, yeah. No, I know. I mean, yeah, nigga, nigga. Yeah. I think, I think with the fan base that I'm building with this, they know. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, we right. know. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? It, and, and it's funny because it's like you end up, you know, having to represent an entire race as a singular individual. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? And it's sometimes like, yo, I mean, I, I think we have, you know, we have similarities and we also have differences. Like, uh -huh. we may react to a situation differently or I may think something goes differently, but like, I'm uh -huh. not the representation of all black people. No. You know what I mean? No. And, and I need other black that. people around so y'all know that it's different uses. Because yeah. you've been called me and I've been called you on yes, several bro. occasions. Hey, <laughs> as, as, soon, as soon as your cohort got to, got to UTA, bro, all of a sudden, everybody started calling me different names. And I was like, like gee, I have been here. Like, how do you not know my name, bro? Like, I'm not the new one, bro. Like, what's up? And it was tough. It was, it was two brothers that came in. Like, it, it was you and, and, and Odoza and Doza that came in. So you and OD came in. And I'm thinking, like, my G, I have been called Terry, Terrence, OD. Uh, all of that, I've been called. I get, I still get called Cedric. It's crazy, <laughs> and I'm like that brother. <laughs> I'm like that brother worked here. 
has been working here longer before I even got here. How do y'all even do that? It is the wildest thing ever. Oh, uh, yeah. Just, that should so, be funny, man. Yeah. So, yeah, you're you right about that, bro. It's, you, it's, you, we get grouped together a lot. You get, you get grouped together a lot. So it was just, it's refreshing. And granted, like, it's, I have no issue with, um, like, uh, creating, developing and cultivating relationships with, with non-blacks. I've been doing that my whole life. Oh, yeah, However, yeah, yeah. And um, just in, in certain times, man, it's, it's man, you got to pick and choose, like, how you deal with your energy. Exactly, man. Just, like I don't know, bro. Because it, it, I'm going to tell you this, and it's something I've become hypersensitive about and hypersensitive to uh, from being in grad school is uh, realizing if I'm changing or obscuring myself to make that other person comfortable. Because when it comes to any relationship, the only way for that relationship to grow is to reach a point where you push a boundary. Like a lot of times we don't, we don't realize that, but like, that's how they grow is a boundary gets pushed in some kind of way, whether it's nonchalantly. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. And so when you and one thing I, I found each time from come from becoming hypersensitive about certain things is with my relationship w- with uh, with non blacks, there's like a there's like a timer that turns on. Like when when you start, it, there's a timer to when that that time happens. For me, it is. I always feel it. It's like all right, well, we on the clock. Cause like we can do all this like cool shit and, and uh, you know, we kind of are of, like testing the boundaries, don't really make too many jokes and blah, blah, blah. And then after, after a little while, whether there's drinks involved or it's just, or time makes them comfortable, somebody's going to say something that's going to be a little bit out of pocket. And that is the test of where this relationship is going to go from here. And so it's happened so many times <laughs> in the past three years. At times I just find myself like, bro, I, I, I need to be around people who understand me as well. So yeah. that, that is, a, that is a, a, a stone cold factor right there. Yeah, because it's funny, man. Because, you, like you said, it's a you. You know, I think we, especially as black men in these white spaces of like higher education, even in business and in, in, in things that we're quote unquote not normally in, <clears throat> or just a small percentage in, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, in order to be successful, you got to maneuver in a way to. Not and not to say to make white people comfortable, but like, yeah, yo, I can't go in super aggressive on some, yo, y'all niggas need to chill, son. I'm running yeah. this bitch. Like I can't yeah. go in my classroom and do that shit. Yeah, but like you know, I still am myself. But uh, right. but it's if you don't it, it feel like I mean that feeling of not being able to have that expression of just let you know uh, figuratively, you know, letting your pants down or. Uh, let, nah, that, yeah, yeah, that may be the wrong saying. I don't know. Let, let, let your hair down. Let, let your hair down. There you go. Yeah, I was like, yeah. let your pants down. Yeah. <laughs> what, nigga? Yeah. Her gay? What are you talking about? <laughs> no, no, let your hair down. But yeah, figuratively, yeah. let your hair down. I'd be like, yo, my nigga, this, this motherfucker said some wild shit to me. You had to yeah. check him. Like, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. Like, that. like, yo, and then you got a story and I got a story. And yeah. We laugh about that shit. But you know what I mean? Just letting yeah. that shit out because I can't go to my white friends and they understand that. Nah, bro. And it's, it's tough. That's what they like. You have to, it's a decision you got to make. Like, we finna, okay, so. I, we you may, you have to make a decision of like okay we need to go ahead and like th- you push that line so now I have to check you and then we can become better from this because you ain't never gonna do that before because I've I've had a situation like that with somebody that we both know yeah yeah who 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 is not who's not black yeah and he used the n word on some on what he thought was some cool shit and I had to. <laughs> <laughs> And it was it was tough because like I knew I knew what he I knew why he was doing it was it was what he thought was some cool shit and I had to tell him like gee all yo, right chill listen. my man hey yo yeah, I was like listen you and I and I want I wanted to make it clear I'm gonna make it all the way clear so that you I had to gather him all I had to get him all the way together because <laughs> I had to let him know like it it wasn't gonna be too many more of those it just it just couldn't be because then then our dynamic is about to change drastically so I had to tell him like look. You, I, I look at you like like you the homie, bro. Like you, you my partner. So if you if you look at me the same way, 
and you want to be my partner, bro, that is something that can never happen again. I don't ever want I don't know who you hang around or who allows you to say that with them, but you can't say that around me, bro. Yo, and and, and that's respect, bro. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and it doesn't have to be like, yo, my nigga, I'm going to slap the shit out of you. Yeah. Now, if you getting there out of line, yeah, I'm like, my, bro. Well, I'm, about yeah. to, I'm about to slap, I'm yeah. about to Charlie Murphy well, chest kick yeah. you out this motherfucking you, window. You can discern the difference between disrespect and, yeah, and yeah, just yeah. And you know, doing yeah. too much. You, you think, you think and, it, and like you said, it's like a child is going to do, if you yeah. don't check a child, they going to, that's why motherfuckers think they're entitled to shit. If you don't check oh, yeah. a child, they're going to push the boundary. If, if they find that they don't have a boundary, they're going to do whatever the fuck they want exactly. to. Exactly. Same way, it's like, yo, can I get away with it? Can I get away with it? Can yeah. I get away with it? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm bro. telling you. Oh, bro. my bad, my bad, my bad. I just, yeah, I was like, all right, we cool, we cool, we cool. Oh, and and, and the checking, the checking has to has to not only be swift, it has to be thorough. Because if you just be like, hey, if you just give them a, hey, chill out, bro, then they kind of, they laugh and I'm like, ah, you know, that wasn't that, that wasn't that thorough. So it's like, it could probably happen again. My homie wasn't tripping when I said it. And that's, that's a thing that I think happens. And it, it's not always something as drastic as saying the N word. Sometimes it's something as silly as shit. Well, okay. Women deal with it. It's, we, we deal with it too, as uh, getting, getting touched in certain ways that people feel entitled to be able to touch you yeah. in a way that you did not, you ain't opened that door and you didn't consent to that. And, um, and so for instance, my fiance deals with that all the time. She has curly hair. Oh yeah. 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 And it's, it, it's awful because like, this is something that happens. And we, I've, I've talked to her about like, Let me the, touch your hair. Yeah. Oh my God. Hey, they, don't, they don't even ask. I've been with her when, when, when things have happened, when women have, non-black women or non-curly hair having women have, have reached over and touched her hair. And they, they doing it because they think is that they, they preface it by saying how beautiful her hair is. However, you do not, you are not entitled to put your hands on me though. But comfort, like when it, when it comes to the idea of, of comfort and like breaking that comfort, it's just like, it's, it's uncomfortable to have to check somebody. It's a, it's it's a, it's a little uncomfortable because it's confrontation. You have to confront them. It's like I, I'm I'm I have to do this thing right now, and it's it's disconcerting to think like I'm gonna have to change the mood of this whole this whole scene right now because I have to check you. And so I've seen her not check somebody before, and I, I felt horrible about. It. It's one of the things I, I feel horrible about um, when it comes to inviting uh, my friend, like black friends, to. My, uh, my my openings, like art openings, if I have a show and there's an opening, because I've se- this has not only happened to my fiance, but it happened to to one of my friends. And I saw her get her hair touched and I just, I felt awful because it was something that I invited them to. And so they see themselves as an extension of me. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, I can't make this situation uncomfortable for anybody because this will reflect badly on Spencer. Mm. so I mean so this is the thing like so like you said people going unchecked they would just keep doing it my G like you it, it literally takes that that one little uncomfortable conversation because I ain't gonna lie it was it was a little uncomfortable having like that he said it and I had to tell him because I was like yeah shit may not be cool but I'm not gonna just live with this negativity in my chest yeah 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 <laughs> you know yeah, 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 so, yeah 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 Look, I'm finna go. I'm gonna go ahead and get this back to you. Here you go. Take this back. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and if you know what I'm saying, if you if you wanna if you trying to still be cool, that's something that can't happen, my G. And so he he was respectful. He didn't he didn't he didn't get silly and tell me why he felt like he should be able to say it. Because I was so glad about that. Because that's something that happens a lot. I've been in that situation before. Yeah. If somebody listen, was trying. Yeah. Listen, white people just. <laughs> Give it up, man. Like, look. <laughs> no, like, I, yeah, I'm gonna say it. You gonna hear the rap songs? I don't give a fuck. It's yeah. not for you, man. Like, just chill. Because here's the thing. Like I always say, and this is just a general. You don't never know how anybody's gonna react to something. So I try to stay respectful yeah. in every matter. Like I treat people how they treat me. If yeah. you stay respectful, I'm gonna be super respectful. If you get out of line, then it's whatever it is. Yeah. Right. 
you know, you all never know. You might be around a black person that just be like, laugh at it. You might be around a black person and be like, yo, my man, chill. You yeah. might be around a black person who will respectfully say why it's not okay. Right. Or you might be around somebody that rightfully takes it upon themselves to fuck you up. <laughs> you uh, know off, what I mean? <laughs> uh, off the rip. Hey, let me tell you. Hey, I was in hey, I was in South by Southwest a few years ago, man. And this was this was back when the uh when all go everything it just came out. Mm-hmm. Sure that James? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, and you know that part on the song. Yeah, yeah. That song, you know, we we in there, I'm in this this huge bar and I don't know, and it was like it was like it was meant to happen this way because it was it was just kind of it was like something off a movie. Like I said, it's, it's place full of people. It's South by Southwest weekend, mm-hmm. and I'm at the bar and I had just got my drink and I'm turning around and they're on the the hook where they get to that part. And from all the people who are walking by, there's this brother that's walking by, and his girlfriend is white. And at, just as she's walking by, they're, they're doing the part where they say the N-word three times. And she said it. And, and said it like she's enjoying herself. Like she said it and, and said it loud. And but like wasn't, wasn't trying to be disrespectful, like looking at me and saying that she just was saying it. And so when she said it, she turned and looked and saw me looking at her. And, I, and I'm just looking appalled, but I kind of just, it was like the appalled face. And then I rested my eyes and just shook my head. I ain't say nothing to her. I just shook my head. And I don't know what it was, but she felt that guilt. It's as if she had seen, it's, it's like she had seen that disapproving look from, from like his one of his family members before. Because she, she felt so compelled to come over and justify it to this stranger who's standing here just shaking his head. And she's like, what? what? And I'm like, all right, bro. I was like, you shouldn't say that word, G. And so she's trying to tell me, well, my son's like, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that's cool. Uh, listen here, bitch. Listen, <laughs> listen. White women. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. And I know black people, I, I know black women going to hate me, but fuck it. This is the Four Colored Men podcast. <laughs> fuck you, bitches. Listen, oh. I fuck white women. And let me tell you something, white women. Just because you have some black put in you, Oh, does Lord. not make you no. That's not the same thing, bitch. I don't know <laughs> what Rachel Dolezal did. You no, know, it's not the same. Don't justify this shit. Listen, stop the justification of the N word. Quit it. Uh, Cut it out. You uh, I fuck with, uh so- like I fuck with my Caucasian fellowship. You know what uh, I mean? Like I, I got plenty of white friends. Yeah. But listen, man. You know what I mean? Chill, chill. <laughs> Let's segue. Let's segue because I want to. That's a lot more I want to get into, right? Yeah, definitely. Go so, ahead. Well, within that, right? Because um, I was talking to Ken, and you know, he went to Morehouse and then the University of Kansas for grad school, right? Yeah. So he had the HBCU experience, and then yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Come on, man! It's Kansas. This is yeah, right. He's everywhere. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know what I, mean? I lived in Kansas before. I know what the fuck that is. Yeah. But um, uh, so so for you, like, I I think our grad school experience, even though it was a PWI, I think we had a a relatively different one because we were able to to have that. Like like you said, your mentor was fucking. You know what I mean? It was yeah. directly representation. Exactly. My mentor was direct. Like yo, I made it. I was so proud of myself for being able to have, like, my thesis committee was all black dudes and a Jew. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. I was proud about that shit. Like, yo, that's what my My shit. My thesis committee was... Shit, all all black dudes and and, and one white woman. No, all black dudes, (laughs) one sister... And a white woman, like it was like we we were in there, bro, because we were able to. You can really get you can really get your shit off and talk about what it is you need to talk about in there. Yeah, and, and the fact is, and, and they understood the work, right? Yeah. Like it sometimes it within creating your work from those experiences, and then doing it for an audience that doesn't re- necessarily know yeah. the nuance in the background. Yeah, wouldn't necessarily get it and try to get yeah. you to change what your idealism is. Yeah. But, but we were able to have that direct leadership 
that understood and yeah. be like, yo, nah, nah, I see what you're doing. This is yeah. how you can make it better, yada, 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 exactly. whatever, whatever. Exactly. They yeah. understood it. Yeah. So within that, like, so you from Houston, yeah. decided to like, yo, I'm gonna do this art school shit. Yeah. What led you to Mizzou? Like that, I've been to Missouri also, and that's some backwood shit. You ever been yeah. to Fort Leonard Wood, nigga? Fuck that. It's a certain side of the post you're not supposed to go on after after yeah. dark. Fuck, you know yeah. what I mean? Like what led you um, to to that and and having those experiences in in, in that space? Because I know it was some fucked up shit that happened in Missouri. I think you oh, were there when it happened, right? Yeah, I, I was. I was there for uh for some of it. I was there for a lot of it. It just social media was social media wasn't popping like that for it to become a national thing overnight. Like things happen now, so it was just you know we we were we were an undergrad you know and shit. When I was an undergrad, I was an undergrad from '05 to '09. So Instagram, people ain't start using Instagram to like 2012. Really, is that when Instagram came out? And even then, Instagram wasn't what. It is now. Instagram was for one only photos back then, and it was really on. People were only using it for their filter to make filters out of it, and then post those to Facebook, like that's or Twitter. So we get, we dealt with a lot of that shit. But anyway, I ended up at um, I ended up at Missouri. I went there for football, and then uh, um, so you did play football. You like yeah, I, I played football for for a hot second, bro. I had to check. I had to yeah, what. Well, hold on. I got. I got. I got to tell this story, right? Like for for y'all that don't know, like this is a, a, a intellectual artist brother. But if you see this nigga, he looked like <laughs> he is of the mountain people of Wakanda. Like this nigga looked like Umbaku, nigga. Like yo, have you ever been with this nigga in the gym? Like God, uh, you, you know, I tried working work it out with this nigga. Like bro. <laughs> Hey, Bruh. hey, no, nah, you, you'd have been, hey, you know, you, you pick back up real quick though. The way you, you were taking all yeah, that time like, yeah, you, it take, like, it don't take you me long to get it. back into it, but like yeah. in, that first few weeks, nigga, like, God damn. Hey, you was <laughs> also I, coming off of, hey, you talking about how I work. <laughs> if y'all don't know, and, and I hope this brother has already told y'all this, this brother was not only a full-time grad student who was also teaching in grad school, this this brother was also working outside of school. He was working and coaching his kids' uh, st- uh, sports teams during season, bro. I don't know how you did that because I wouldn't have made it, my G. I'm gonna tell you that <laughs> right now. Yo, man, and, like and, I, and that's the thing. That, You'd have been right there in the gym all the time, bro. I, I do not blame you. Yo, and that's why I want to do this podcast to show that is is positive black men out here. We out here. We, we out here grinding. We out here working. We out here in high positions. We out here raising our kids. You know what I mean? Doing what we got to do, man. That's what it's about. That's why I'm grinding, trying to put this podcast out and and, and, and build that platform. You know what I mean? That's good um, business. <laughs> but but let's back up a little bit. You you yeah. got so you went to Mizzou on on scholarship. Okay, so it's funny you brought up the uh, the the not being allowed to go to a HBCU. <laughs> so I was uh, it's actually a long silly story, but um, I was actually about to go to Hampton on a scholarship. Oh, I, I, yeah, I, I signed <laughs> I signed on a football and track scholarship to go to Hampton, and then the coach from there ended up leaving and going to Morehouse and wanting to take his recruits with him, but they would have had to be like preferred walk-ons and earn a scholarship at Morehouse. Yeah. And so the same deal happened regarding like being recruited and and being a preferred walk-on and earn a scholarship happened with Mizzou where they contacted uh, the coach at my high school and it was like, you know, this is the opportunity that you have and and you 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 have a good chance of getting that just after playing the one year and they will get you on. And so that's what I, I went there as a preferred uh, walk on. I went there, went to camp and all that. And then that that's what had me at football at Mizzou because they kind of took care of me. And I had some partial money that they put forward for me to go there until they were going to give me my full. 
So yeah. that's how I ended up up there, which was it was pretty smooth, man, until I had to make a decision of one or the other. And so but anyway, so that's how I landed up there in football. Uh, that's how I landed up there in Mizzou for football. And uh, I, I saw some. I saw some differences real quick from Texas and Missouri that, mm-hmm. um, man, I didn't, I didn't realize what the, what, what the, the deal was. First off, it, I learned how diverse Houston was once I went to Missouri mm-hmm. and I saw a huge lack of diversity. And so, um, you know, with diversity comes like knowledge of culture, like, <laughs> you know, like knowledge and tolerance of other cultures of their Nah, G, it wasn't like that at all. And uh I and it's crazy. That's the first time I had I had experienced overt discrimination of any kind was at Missouri. And I grew up in Texas. But yeah. I had to go to Missouri to to see what overt discrimination felt like. And it happened at a uh, it happened at like a, a tailgate I had gone to. And uh, it, we so when I went there, it was a couple of my a couple of my uh, my partners from back home. We all three of us went up to Mizzou at the same time, and um, none of us had cars when we went up there. We had all left our our little rinky dink high school cars back in in Houston. The mm-hmm. would not have made that drive. So <laughs> none of us had cars, and so um, they lived in a dorm that what, I didn't live in the same dorm as them. So I was always over there where they were. And so they were, you know, they had friends who had cars, so we would always ride places with them. Now, we had made friends with, with basically everybody on their floor. And we were the only black guys on like like that were around, like yeah. in, in that little group. And uh so we had we had some friends with two two um young two white girls that were our age, and they were hella cool. Yeah. And they had a car. And they were like, hey, they invited us to go to a tailgate with them. And we were like, cool. Just naive. We don't know no better. We would, you know, because I think about it now. I probably been like, "What tailgate you talking about?" You know, so like, well, who, who gonna be there? Like, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we we naive. We thinking college is college. Let's go hang out. So we go. They drive and we go. We pull up. It's at this big tent that's like in this parking lot, and it's a big like frat tailgate. Mm-hmm. But it's like all you know, like white fraternities. And so, you know, we we walk in, we and I, we're honestly thinking nothing of it, really. We just walking in. It is what it is. And we, like I said, naive. And so we're standing there, they're like, we'll be right back. They walk off and come back with beers and hand us beers. And we sitting there and we just drinking, just talking. Mm. Like I said, not thinking about anything at all, not even worried. Next thing you know, I don't know if my partners realized, but I realized at some point, I was like, Huh. I said, I, I, was, I was like, I don't know if I'm tripping or not, but people are looking at us. Like, gee, like people was just, people were looking at it not, but I was like, ah, whatever. And then I looked up again and we were we were legit surrounded. Like the people who was looking at us had closed in on us. My and I, and, I, and at that point I didn't even see the girls we came in with. Mm-hmm. We were just surrounded by dudes. And so um I kind of like nudged my, my partners like, you see was like pay attention, cause I, you know, what I'm saying if, if if something goes down, bro, like you need to be paying attention. And so, as everybody is surrounding us, one, two dudes walk over. They don't say nothing to us. Mm-hmm. They just reach for the beers that are in our hand, and we've already opened and are drinking. Mm-hmm. They reach for the beers that's in our hand, and we and we're clutching them. And 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 I'm I'm like, what you doing? He doesn't say anything. He doesn't even acknowledge that I'm talking to him. He's just still holding on to the beer. And then the guy who's next to him is like, we're going to need those back. And we're trying to figure out, like I said, when when stuff like this happens, you go through like a series of of emotions really quick. And I I think the first one is is confusion. No matter, and and it's it's no matter what it is, no matter how much that you've been through, whether whether it lasts a millisecond or not, but there's like there's like confusion and then denial that happens where it's just like, wait, what's happening? There's no way this is what this is. Cause it's just like, you know, discrimination or any any type of like negative uh like prejudice, it's it's so absurd. Like our spirits know better. It's just like this is really crazy. Like is this really happening right now? And so that's what it was. And you know, 
it got to the point where it was enough people around us who was just like, it ain't worth these beers, <laughs> you know, to get, you know, we ain't, we can't take all of them. Yeah, yeah, and, it, yeah. and, it, and it ain't worth these beers. So we, we handed the beers off like, all right. And at that point, like, we just kind of left. We, you know, tapped our own girls like, look, we, we finna go. And it was from there that I realized, like, we in a different place. But, gee, like, we ain't in Texas no more. And we, we definitely not in Houston anymore where something like this probably wouldn't happen as overtly as this. Mm. Like, if it's, you know, so that that was one of the – that was the first experience in, in Missouri that I, that, I was, that I felt that was just like, man, this, we in a different place. And then, of course, there was the other thing that uh, – this did make the news. It was on the the night before February first. Was the was, cotton thing? The cotton, yeah. So that yeah. happened when I was there. The night before February first, we have a there's a center. We have a we have a building in the middle of campus called the Black Cultural Center. Mm. The Gaines Oldham Black Cultural Center. And Gaines and Oldham are uh, are two black alumni, and uh, so this is the only place on campus that is ours. Mm-hmm. That talks about our culture, like all the all the Greek plot, all the Black Greek organization has plots, on like it, like in front of the center, and that's just a place that, that we go and we gather and we we completely feel safe and comfortable. The only place that is that we know is it's for us to feel comfortable and and included and 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 safe. And so um, everybody knows this. Like there's there's been protests about it, but. You know, it's still it's still there. So the first night, I mean, the, the night before the first day of uh, Black History Month, uh, these these two students put cotton balls. It's like they, they took bags and ba- empty bags and bags of cotton balls in the yard of the Black Cultural Center. And, uh, you know, what I'm saying, and like, you know, it, it it was they were trying to make, you know, they were trying to hurt us like in two ways. First off, it's the sight of, of of that cotton being there. And then in order to pick it up, in order to clean it up, you'd have to bend over and pick up cotton yeah. to clean to clean up the mess that they had made. So in one way, it's like you get the visual of that, and then you get the visual of what it looks like to have black people bending over and picking cotton on their own space, which was telling us a lot about how they felt, you know, how some people felt about us being there. Yeah. So, you know, this was back in, I think this was maybe 2000, I think it was 2009, I believe. So, yeah, so that, that happened. And, uh, bro, it was, you know what I'm saying? Like, it it was crazy. It was another one of those things that was kind of like in denial, but, like, things were kind of boiling. But, like, nobody was bold enough to actually do something to us. Mm-hmm. Or say something to our faces like what happened a couple years ago. But uh but yeah, so that's that's what was going on in Missouri, man. Like you yeah, I mean, you know, we, we were faced with some stuff like that. And it's it's kinda it's it's rough to deal with that, you know, at your school. You know what I'm saying? Like it's this where you go to school, this where you trying to you here for the same reasons they here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like we here for the same reasons and you know, it's that kind of ignorance of, of, of that aspect. And it's, I think, honestly, I think it's a, uh, it's a sense of entitlement. And also uh, there's a, there's a factor of, of hu- like hierarchy of humanity that is still in play. And that is a huge issue. Like even today is the idea of who, who is human and who is it, or who's, who's worth more as a human and who is it. And I, and I think that that speaks to a lot of things right now. And I think that, you know, just that kind of thing was one of them. And it, there's certain systems that kind of show that. For instance, like the thing that happened at, like at, at my undergrad a couple of years ago where a student was a, a female student, a black, a black woman, a young black woman was mm-hmm. harassed by a group of white males and what they called it an N-word and followed them mm-hmm. for like a block while they were on campus and like, you know, just harassed them for like a, for, for like a few minutes. And they, you know, they would, they were scared cause they getting followed by dudes and getting called the N word. And so the sister wrote enough. She wrote a letter to the president of the university telling her about this. Like I am a student here and another student, another group of students did this, this, and this, you know, like what, you know, what can we, I just want to bring this to your attention. Like, what is it? What can we do? And, the president didn't respond. See, like he had no, he had no answer for it. And so, 
what what ensued was, um, you know, okay, now we have to up the ante. Now we have to find another way to get your attention. And so homecoming came around and they did a protest during homecoming in the middle of the parade. Like as the president's car was coming through the parade, they stood in the way and, you know, asked for an audience with him. Because they're like, we, we wanted to meet with you. You didn't want to talk to us. So here we are. And he stayed in that car and watched how other people from outside of the parade walked up and and proceeded to try to push them off the road while using the university's chant. And so what what happened there was was a clear, I think it was a clear indication of, of a type of worth because you talk about one student, one group of students who was literally harassing another group of students but the president of this university has decided that their problem is not worth doing anything about. And he didn't even leave his car to come address the students. I mean, it was it was a clear indication of like how he saw like what your work as a student here isn't the same as, as somebody I would actually do something for. As, as he watched other people push them out of the road. Push them out of the way so that his car could keep going, and it, it, it spoke volume, volumes. And that's why the uh, you know the brothers brothers on the football team ended up getting organized, and they decided they weren't going to play until he was removed as the university uh, president. And then that was a big thing that happened. And that's that's what that was. It was just like you supposed to you supposed to represent all of us, but you obviously don't see us as as equal value. To your white students, yeah, and but the funny thing about it is, those white students ain't bringing in billions for your university. You might want to look out for the brothers because here's the thing: one thing that I've noticed about being at universities, yeah. if you find a group of black people at a predominantly white university, most more times than not, they're the athletes. A lot of times, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, and you think about that, like. <laughs> like uh if 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 every brother was the protest playing sports, yo, those I shits wouldn't even be you. worth watching. I mean, you want to watch it, you, you want to watch an NBA game for yeah. layups and, and, <laughs> and, and three pointers. <laughs> like and you, nobody wants to watch the Lakers versus the Knicks. <laughs> When it's 39 to 28. Nigga, no, like, bro. The no, game just full, full of the fundamentals. <laughs> full of Nobody wants to watch that shit. But nah, when you say, bro. hey, nah, we ain't doing it, the motherfuckers start losing money, then some shit oh. started happening. Man, let, me tell, let me tell you the way the mountains moved. It was it was Sunday night, and it was it was a brother that was on the team when I was there. That came back and, and and talked to them. He's like a he's a um, I think he's like an ESPN correspondent now, um, or writer. Excuse me. He he came and and, and met with he organized with the brothers and kind of talked to them. He was like, look, if y'all want something to happen, you all are gonna have to stick together on this, and this is how you're gonna do it. And they and they released a statement saying, we will not play or practice unless. He resigns as as university uh, president, and so they released this statement on Sunday night. And so they, I think they they called they. I mean, they called they bluff. They called they bluff. So Monday happened. Them brothers ain't go to practice. Tuesday morning, they got that president up out of there <laughs> because because you got You got to weigh it out. If you call they bluff, and these first off, they didn't miss the practice. That's 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 preparation that they don't have. So even if they couldn't even risk them missing two practices for them not to be prepared on Saturday, much yeah. less not playing not on, play Saturday. on Saturday. Yeah. Because there's so much bread that gets lost from not having, because this, this Mizzou, they SEC, they, you, they games going to be on TV. You watch our games. You tell me that you, you tell me the brothers ain't going to play. We don't got it. <laughs> we got to forfeit that game. What you mean? <laughs> Who we going to put out there? 
You know what I'm saying? Who, who, put, who we gonna put on? Who we gonna put these pads on? And yeah, put out there? Niggas out there looking like the replacements. I'm telling you, you gonna put Keanu Reeves out there, nigga? I'm telling you, what you, what, you gonna do? what you gonna What you gonna you gonna go down to the high school? And like, give me your best dudes. What, who you got? You may come back go. with CTE like a motherfucker. I'm like, telling whoa. you, bro. What are you What are you gonna do? So they 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 saw how much they were gonna lose. Because honestly, I, I don't think it. I don't think. I don't think Mizzou actually, you know, cared about <laughs> what we were talking about. It was just about the money. Cause like, yeah, I no, honestly exactly, think, exactly. I honestly think like they, you know, a lot, a lot of Americans still don't view black folks as, as actual full human beings. You got to think of it. Like when you, you, in a country where in the constitution, one group, what it was written that one group was was classified as three fifths of a human being, and that's that that was part of their country's culture. That's that's a hard thing to break, my G. Like it's so you got people who still think this way. Yeah, so yeah. So they look at us as as like bodies, and they were like, "No, nah, I need I need the bodies to be out there on that field." So, and, and the thing is, it is about money. And I say this like my genuine thought on this, right? Like. We talk about not at the at the social level, yeah, but at like the structural level, right? Yeah. Systematically, yeah, it's not really about racism. It's about right. money. It's about yeah. their bottom line. How can we make the most money? And that usually comes from impoverishment of others, uh-huh. right? And yeah. and on the level of that, that's why like a lot of white people voted for Trump because they felt poor and disenfranchised. So yeah. it's, it's, it's that community. But they getting fucked over worse than we are, but they feel like, you know, well, we could still say we're better than black people. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? But at the highest level, it's on a financial level or mm-hmm. a financial basis. So if we can affect finance, that's how we change shit. Like, you know, protesting, right. if you, if you, hurt somebody pockets, then they got to listen to you. That's why yeah. I give it up for like the LBGT community, because they uh-huh. know how to work the... Hey, you say yeah. something about us, we gonna fuck your money up. Every real Immediately. <laughs> yeah, and we gonna, yeah, and we, gonna, yeah. we gonna immediately get you out of there, because yeah. anybody and anybody who stand with you on that dumb shit you said is gonna be out of there. And so it immediately makes people leave. Like, when somebody say something crazy, boy... They get them out of there, and ain't nobody taking up for them. They like, nope, no, nope, I ain't trying finished. to get my hands dirty. I got exactly. two. I got, I'm not fucking up my bag. Straight up, because <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your bag will be out of there with the quickness. Don't even play yourself. Yeah, man. But so, but changing, changing, changing topics a little bit, right? Yeah. Now, this is something I did want to talk to you about, right? Yeah. So, well, you said. You're um, what Nigerian and Cameroon, Cameroonian, right? And like, like your parents are from Africa and then came here. Like, what, what? No, like, generation no, are you? no, 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 no. So, um, so this is this is all from my uh, my DNA, my ancestry DNA. So the uh, the lineage. So the what's wild is I was this was back in two thousand eight. Like in 2008, when I um, first found this out, we have a, my mom's side of the family, we have a, a historian who is the, the oldest living family member. Mm-hmm. And so she was the one who, she she first traced hers back in 2008. And so that's when she first told the family, like, this is this is our lineage and uh, we should research this back in 2008. But it was 2008 and I was like, okay. So I didn't even think. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think nothing of it. I was, you know, what I'm saying I was, I was like 20 years old, so I was like, "All right, bro." Yeah. And uh, you know, so it wasn't until I started, you know, wanting to get a better grasp on on who I am, and you know, trying to find a way to to like define myself, and not not as something that's finite, but define myself as an ever changing thing, but having an origin to start from. And so I had that, but I knew nothing about it, bro. I ain't know nothing about it, and and uh, and that was just my mom's side. And so from my dad's side, um, all I knew was where the family started from slavery, like from Virginia to New Orleans, then moving to, uh, to to Texas. And then when they were free, they went to Freeport and then made their way down to, to Houston. Mm-hmm. 
So um, in doing that research, man, I went ahead and, and had my uh, did my ancestry DNA, where it confirmed uh, the the Nigerian and Cameroonian uh, lineage, and and it, it pinpointed like where in Nigeria, like where did it start in Nigeria, and then uh, how it made its way uh, through Cameroon and even down to Congo, and I think that's where some of, like my father's side comes from, but for the most part, a lot of it was. Um, it shows the highest concentration of the people who share my DNA in uh, Nigeria and Cameroon. And so I pinpointed it, found the actual state, and then saw where it went from Nigeria to Virginia, like my dad said, and then it made its way all the way down to Houston. And uh, from there, it had, like, it was really interesting. I think anybody who was who was wondering should definitely go ahead and and pay you a little little forty four yeah. like fifty four dollars and, and yeah. just, ooh, just find out because it's, it's actually pretty live and then if you get the chance or whatever kind of connect you have try to go to the country that that you connected to. Well, you know it's funny. You know it's funny. I I be thinking about that. I be wanting to do it. Like I be wanting to do it. Like I want to. Yeah. I want to know where I'm from. But like yeah. trace my lineage and such. But I'm also. A bit of a conspiracy theorist, and I feel yeah. like the government's just collecting my DNA to clone me. Happens, <laughs> <laughs> so like I, yeah. I'm, I'm sort of iffy on it. But you know what's funny? Like I just recently there was a conference at, at, at my campus, and they had a, um, uh, like I say, everything's about race and diversity, all this other stuff. And they had a, a, a doctor, and I'm forgetting the brother's name. You know, and it, I got the program. And I want to shoot him an email because I want to get him on. But he talked about, uh, uh, you know, black genetics. Yeah. And one thing they did touch on was like the the ancestry thing. Mm-hmm. And it's really based off what's already been collected. Like, yeah. it's it's a database that's of what they found. And then they compare your DNA to whatever. And then it's whatever closest tribe or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's still like limited to an extent, yeah. until they broaden their their database. There's a, yeah, there's a there's a new one that is uh, African ancestry. Mm. There's a so that was a new. One. I think I'm gonna try that one next. But there's there's different there's different levels to the ancestry DNA uh, thing that you subscribe to. Like there's and it I don't it doesn't cost anything extra. It's just like the, the more research you do in it, which mm. is how I pinpointed the actual state. And like what what tribe is in that state, but um, but yeah, I, I mean, there's it's a thing to be skeptical about at times. It's just the thing that kind of made it that reassured me a little bit was um, how it links you to other people. And I've actually like found like my own cousins that are in there mm-hmm. whom I've met, and I was like, oh shit! Like, and it's it's wild to like see that in there where you see like your your actual cousins' names that are in there. Cause I didn't do that. I didn't do the family tree. I didn't fill out all that. Ugh. I just, you know, I just went and then I found it something like, okay, so these are the cousins that have done this that I, that I found. So it's, I don't know, but I, I think one thing I would want to try is the African ancestry one. And just to kind of like confirm that too. Cause like I said, I was told about it back in 2008. And then when I did it for myself, it was consistent with the results from 2008 that, you know, and you know, I'm sure the algorithm, whatever algorithm was used or whatever it was it was used in 2008 had to be different. So, yeah. and I just did it back in 2017. Mm. Yeah, man. I, I, I think I'm going I'm to do it eventually. I'm, Cause I, you know, like everything, I just give up and go with the flow, but yeah. I'm really, I, I'm really hesitant. But, but so with that, right? Like, yeah. and I've been wanting to talk to you about, because this, I thought this was dope as fuck. Because, yeah. like I said before, you know, my man is really out here working. If you want to make a living as, a, as an artist, man, it's possible. This man has, you know, exhibitions. I've been to his openings. Yo, yo, I, I, he has a Terry Blues exclusive, which I want to buy. Which I, When yeah. I earn up enough bread, I'm going to buy that a fucking original. If it ain't hanging up in a goddamn museum, I'm going to buy that goddamn original Terry Blues painting. You got um, it, man. <laughs> but, uh, um, but one of your most recent, well, not maybe not most recent, but you were able to go to Africa, to Sudan, yeah. With the fucking U.S. Embassy yeah. to paint a mural, yo, yeah. two things, right? So tell me how you even got that, mm-hmm. and then 
I really want to know how your ex, how that like what your experience was like, and then how that changed you as mm-hmm. a person and an artist. Yeah. So, man, first off, and you know this, you know this in 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 any game that has to do with uh, you know creative expression or just any any type of game where it's like this is a thing that you do that's different. It's all about who you get in the room with which is one of the things that comes with working so hard. One of the reasons I worked so hard, and I'm, I'm sure it's one of the reasons you work. So I always saw y'all working and like I'm, I'm competitive. I wanted to be the best, but I also I was like, I'm going to take advantage of everything that I have here because I want everything. And so you, I work hard so that I'm always ready. So that anytime I get in the room with the right person, it's a wrap, you know what I'm saying? So when it came to the Sudan thing, that all stemmed from me having my solo um, show at the Arthello Beck Gallery at the South Dallas Cultural Center for my uh, my, my thesis show, my MFA thesis. And um, so th- there's a sister that basically, you know, is the pioneer of that place, and you know, and is, a, is an she's an authority on on art in North Texas. And this is uh, Vicky Meeks, was Vicky Meeks. And so she's, you know, she, she's heavy in the game and people, people value what she has to say. So I, I, I did a mural in the, uh, like one of the rooms in that gallery in there. And yeah, yeah she, I remember that joint. Yeah. 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 So she, she showed up, appreciate it, bro. She showed up as I was working on it. Now I didn't even, I mean, I didn't see her when she did. Cause I was probably in the zone with the music blast and just doing it. But on the, during the, the opening of that show, she, she walked up on me and we were talking. She was like, I actually saw you when you were painting this, but you didn't see me. And I was like, Oh, it was so good to meet you. Blah, blah, blah. So this was in, this was November when that happened. Around January, she sent me an email. She was like, look, a friend of mine uh, works uh, for this, works for this organization that, you know, kind of, you know, there's projects all over the world and they're doing one in Sudan. It's a, it's a mural project with the U.S. Embassy. And um, I'm wondering, would you want to do it? So I could tell her to send you the application, you know, so you can be in that pool of artists that they're looking at. And I'm like, of course. And I don't even care when it's happening. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was just like, yeah, you know, send me that. So it, it all came from Vicky Meeks seeing what I seeing what I did, just being in the right room, with her, being in the room where she was meeting her and then her passing my name off to get the opportunity to do it. So it threw my name in a pool of artists that were being considered. And out of, out of all the artists that they were, they were looking at, they looked at, you know, what I do and then my resume and my proposal. And so they saw, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm low key fresh off of a, a trip to Africa. And this is the kind of work that I'm doing. And, uh, and I do murals as well. And so they, you know, they were like, Oh, this is good. This, this is the guy. Cause I'm I'm doing work that has to do with like a connection between us and 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 our people over there, and so it turns out what they wanted to do was uh, this was like for Black History Month, so they chose it during Black History Month, but the project was for April. So what they wanted was to create a mural that connected uh, issues of uh, social justice or social injustice and um, and conflict resolution in Sudan with that of the American civil rights movement. And I thought that was, you know, interesting for, you know, somebody to decide like that they wanted to try to pair those together. But I was like, all right. So, you know, I did some writing, did some sketches, did a little bit of uh, research. And, uh, and I was just thinking, I was like, you know, I found some similarities just from doing the, you know, the research that I did, but I was still kind of iffy about it. And I made the decision that I wasn't going to be concrete on anything until I went over there. And bro, it was a you know it was it was a seven day trip. It was no, like eight days. I was there for like uh, seven days. The eighth day was me traveling. But um, it was I had to do this whole mural and and give a couple lectures, do a talk, and teach a uh, a little seminar on making murals, all within this time. And so I'm thinking, but I don't care because who I am, I'm like, get, give me that. Give me all that. I want to do all that. I like being, I want to, I'm over there. I want to talk to as many people as possible. So 
everybody got something to say about how, you know, things are in a place they've never been, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, so I, unfortunately, I had some ideas about what Sudan may be like, but having been to Nigeria and having a lot of those preconceived notions proved to be wrong, I, I, I went over to, you know, Sudan thinking like, nah, it's not going to be probably what people are saying. Mm. So I show up, man, and it's and anytime you go to Africa, man, the the one of the greatest things, like as 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 a black person, especially a black American, is to land in a country where everybody look like you. Mm. I mean, just showing up where everybody's skin is brown, it's man, it's a totally different, and it, it sounds really simple, but when you're in it, bro, and it's it's like seeing yourself everywhere. And uh, it's it's something to where like you never feel like you're actually out of place, which is something that happens often here. And it's like we we get we're used to it, so like we're like fake numb to it. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, when you don't feel that way at all, it's like it's almost like you feel your power surfacing because you're not using any energy trying to translate yourself. Mm-hmm. You're not using any energy trying to translate your expression into something that is supposed to be safe or non-threatening for those who are seeing it. When you're not when you're not using that energy and you get to fully be yourself, you feel your power surfacing and it is the most amazing feeling ever. So I felt that in both countries that I went to. Uh, I felt that in, in Nigeria and I felt that in Sudan. And it was amazing because it was it was a different it was a different way. I, one country is on the West, other was on the East. So, um, you know, I, and I didn't know that it would be that way in both places. So anyway, I, I land and I'm there and I'm, you know, I, I get met by the, you know, the correspondent with the embassy. And, you know, I'm, I'm getting moved around. And one of the things that was so cool about it is that at this point, I'm dealing with the government. You know, so it's the government that's like it's the U.S. government that that knows I'm there and their, their top priority is making sure that I'm good. So everywhere I went, I'm in an armored car with another armored car there. Yo, that's, that's the my nigga rolling so, around with my nigga oh, rolling around like the president. Hey, yeah, they treat my nigga like Obama. Like, oh yeah. my god, that was, oh my god. I'm telling you, dude, that, that's what it was like. <laughs> hey, I was, I was, hey, I was fake, this nigga came back like Eddie Murphy. This nigga had a zebra. <laughs> dude had a zebra skin coat. <laughs> Straight up, bro. It was live. <laughs> And so, um, and so it turns out I'm 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 the first American artist to be to be brought there to do to do a project. Oh and wow! So it was a, so it was a big it was a big deal, and that's how it was shit. And I didn't even know that it was going to be a deal like that, but like that's how it was. And so, not only did the you know the U.S. government was you know of course knowing that I was there doing all this shit, but the Sudanese government knew I was there. And so it was it was something that was um, it was kind of surreal. The idea that like, oh, no, there's that there, there, people know you here. And I was like, really? So like there was like, gee, there was news cameras that were, that would show up at certain things. Like when I was doing so, there'd be news cameras there. Yeah. And, um, and so so that was cool, man. And one of the things that, that was so live was that um, they made it so that one of the things I said was so really important was for me to talk to to a lot of people before I started the mural because I wanted the mural to be theirs because it's staying there with them. I don't want to just come up and do some American shit on the wall and be like, all right, y'all, I'm out. You know what I'm saying? Like, nah, it's not that, like, whatever it is that I'm called here to do, I want y'all to be good with it, being here. And so... Um, so it's, you know, so I was at the, it was the art school that's this in town. It's a Sudan University College of uh, uh, Fine and Applied Arts. Mm-hmm. And um, the wall that they gave me to work with is, uh, it's it's facing the street. So it's the main wall. So there's a wall and there's a big garden and then there's the gate to where the street is. So like you you step into the campus, you see that big wall. And so you're going to see the mural that, that I worked on. And so um, they had set it up to where I, I met with elders. I met with people that's around our age. And then I met with the youth. 
And I even spoke with uh, this this like group of artists who are on the other end of the spectrum who who aren't as privileged. So they had a totally different take on certain things. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that was amazing was uh, asking them questions and kind of like getting getting the correct, you know, getting honest answers from them. Because on one end, I had so I asked the questions of like, what is what does it mean to be Sudanese? You know, what is life here? Like for for Sudan, for the Sudanese people, what is what is your society doing, and how has that shaped you? That's the, you know because I wanted to see how you know it could relate because it, it tied into my research and also for what the mural was going to be. And uh, the first things I was hearing was, "Oh, life is great. You know, everybody gets along. No matter what um, what religion you 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 are, whether you're Muslim or Christian or um, Jewish or, or or atheist, it doesn't matter." And I'm like, oh, okay, you know, that sounds live, you know what I'm saying? And I was just like, okay. And so that night I met with some artists who who were in a different group and on another side of society. And when I explained that to them, but they they bust out laughing like, nah, G, it ain't like that at all. And so they, they got to telling me that like, you know, unity is a big thing that everybody wants, but unfortunately it's not there. They're not there yet. And uh, there's there's forces that that play their uh, their differences against each other because there's tribes there still, mm-hmm. and and that's a whole other conversation. The idea of like tribes, but like but there you know there, there's tribes there. You know, in Africa there's different tribes that you know that people are from, and so they were saying like you know I can't even marry this like let's say I fall in love with this girl, her family, like I, I can't marry her unless she leave her family. <laughs> And gets like completely like ostracized because of who I am or or my skin being this dark or my hair being like this or me being in this type of tribe. He said, this is a thing that happens here. And I was like, OK. He said, however, we do want unity. We do want to all be together because we love we all love being Sudanese. No matter what kind of life we have, we love being Sudanese. And it has nothing to do with like the borders of this place or the government itself that that tells us what country we're from. It's the people. And we love being a part of this. We all love this this identity of being Sudanese. Because you know, there's there was a civil war that that civil war was was fairly recent, actually. So then that was just, there's Sudan and like South Sudan. But um, so, yeah, so like there's still issues that there's like refugee camps as people being displaced by that conflict and all that. And so from there, I had my project. I had what that what that um, that mural was going to be and how it could connect it to the American Civil Rights Movement, which was and I, and I chose uh, one of my favorite photos from that, which is one with with brothers and sisters with their arms interlocked. Because I thought about how that was more powerful to me than having us screaming and holding signs. I thought our unity, just see, just the, the sight of us moving as one is the most powerful image and most frightening for anybody who decides they're not with us. And I believe that to be true in our circumstance here and any other place that black folks are. Is that when you see us move together, I'm telling you, God help whomever is against us on the day that we unify and you cannot get in between us. That's why there's campaigns that are in place to make sure that doesn't happen. That's why that's why money is used the way it is. And it keeps us from actually making that happen. There's so much distraction that keeps us from doing that. Because when we move that way and we cannot be bought off and we can't be intimidated, it is a wrap because of how much we are needed here. Our gifts, can you cannot put a price on our gifts. That's why our gifts are like the, the most valuable imports and exports ever. The, the things that we create affect the world. And and anybody who doesn't know that is playing themselves. So I use that image of of um, so I, I had I had the Sudanese brothers and sisters that there was a there was six students that were from a refugee camp that were chosen from an art um, competition, mm-hmm. and uh, they were chosen. And there were three uh, recent grad students from the art school, and uh, the dean of the 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 school and one of the professors there, I had them all interlock their arms 
and and take this photo. And I used them as a reference. And I, I did a bunch of research and had them help me with the research where each of them was from a different tribe. Like there's that there's that many tribes there to where, you know, you could take 12 people and have different tribes. And so I, I and so I dressed them up and painted them as, you know, Sudanese people from different tribes and different regions of Sudan. And they're all with their, I have their arms all interlocked facing the same direction. And uh, I was like, man, it's a cool idea, blah, blah, blah. We did that and they were cool with it. We did some, you know, some, I did some more research on, on other visuals and symbols and then we, we move, we move with it. And it wasn't until we started to put that mural on the wall and people were coming from all over to come see this happen, to come see like, oh, they have brought this American artist to here to do this thing and blah, blah, blah. And so everybody came to watch us making this mural and it, it touched my heart to see how much it meant to everybody to see their specific tribe on that wall. I mean, folks were standing there and pointing and, and, you know, and everybody spoke uh, Arabic. And so they were there and they were, you know, they were pointing and saying like, this, that's, that's my tribe. This is where I'm from. And this is what they were. And, and it meant something to them that this brother from America and it, it they they felt this closeness with me because just because like I I cared to do it. And that's how they they're, they're like it's you know did you you really wanted to like you wanted to come to Sudan and all of a sudden I'm like man honestly like I feel like this whole experience chose me like I don't even know that this is some shit I want to do. And so so that's what that was so a lot of the power came from, a lot of a lot of that energy the great energy and that power came from the, uh, our brothers and sisters over there, just the way they, they poured into me and showed me love just just for me being there. Because they could have very well, and I did have to answer this question with, with some folks of, um, you know, like, why why are you here? Kind of yeah. thing. You know, this one brother, because it was a group of artists that I met with, and he was telling me, uh, he, was like, he was like, why would they choose a black American to come here and talk about what's happening in Sudan. Like, what about your experience would qualify you to talk about that? Mm-hmm. And, and, and I was, and I'm like, good, let's really talk. Let's really, let's really do this. I like, I, I want to hear this because everybody been really cool, but like, I, I know that there's some concerns and so I'm like, yeah. And so we're, we're talking and I kind of explained to him about how, um, you know, y'all have these conflicts with each other. And I said, we do too, right? I said, we have conflicts with each other too. And it's, it, we, we found that it's a deeper rooted thing that, that is connected to uh, being conditioned to have a conflict with ourselves. Mm. And, I, and I was like, I, I don't know if you see it that way. I don't know if you, I don't know if you see it that way, but, but for us, we know that there is something wrong with, with like our interactions with each other because there's this weird dynamic of us not being, we, we can't help but to migrate to each other, even in the face of being conditioned to not like each other. But we yeah. can't help but be around, we can't help but want to be around each other. And, and so I was explaining to him, like, you know, you, you talk about how your government exploits y'all's differences to keep you divided in certain ways. I said, our government does the exact same thing. And I said, what, what makes it, what makes it worse is I, I was, and I don't know. And, and people can have like their own opinion about it, but we have, a, I, and I said, in America, I was like, we, we have a look, we have more things that are accessible to us th- than you all do, but they serve as distractions to where you would think it would be good to have these things, but they serve as distractions that kind of keep us unhappy in a sense because we've also be, been conditioned to value things over each other, which is completely unnatural when it comes to the type of people we are. And uh, and, I, and I, I was like, I, I honestly, and I was from my experience, like our my spirit is in turmoil when it comes to that because I know that you're more important than these shoes that that your life is more important than these shoes that I may want to come and shoot you over. You know what I'm saying? But we live in a place that worships things. And so (laughs) 
we see the we see things go over the value of our lives all the time and it's completely contrary so like you there, there's like a there's a there's a there's a torture that that goes on inside of us and so i won't say that that eat, that is the end all be all that equips me to come and talk about what it is to be Su- sudanese as well and i said but that's why i'm here talking to you brother that's why I want you to ask me these questions. That's why I want to understand it more. Because I can tell you, like, because I want to let you know where I'm coming from. Just as much as I want you to tell me where you're coming from. Yeah. And I said, that that's what, and I said, you know, I'm I'm just the guy that they chose. And, and by God's grace, I'm passionate about extending this message in the best way I can so that the people who live here, where this piece is being left, can feel close to it. You know what I'm saying? It's just, I was like, so that's, that's, that's the long and short of it. I said, brother, I just, I just pray that I can, I can deliver. You know, I didn't, I didn't choose, I didn't choose myself to be in here, but I I know I'm going to do everything I can to make this pop like it's supposed to. And, and that was that. And I I mean, it was just, I still talk to that brother. Like I, I still talk to him like to this day. And so it's just, you know, Stuff like that. So it's it it's in the people, man. Like it, that, that's one of, that's one of the things that is crazy. I had to go to another continent to feel that way and see things that way. But I learned to value people more from being out there because seeing seeing how the way they gave me love before I could even do anything for them. They were just giving me love just off the rip, just off the strength of me being that this brother that's here and he not from here. He wanted to come here. He looked like me, and so I am him, and he, and 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 I ha- and he's here with me now, and I and like a piece of me will go back with him back where he's from. One thing people kept telling me when I was in Nigeria and in Sudan: tell our brothers and sisters about us, because they could not believe that there's that there's this imaginary rift between black people, black Americans, and Africans. They, they were appalled at the idea that we don't like each other. They were appalled at the idea that they don't like us. They were like, what? No, we would. It, but one of the strongest things somebody told me in Nigeria was that if uh, a, sister told, a sister told me and, another, and a brother told me this too, huh. if we could, if we could make the room, like we could make room and shift the climate an environment to your liking, we would take all of you back right now. Yo, that, you know what's funny? It's funny you say that, right? Because it's wild. Because I always, so I have this debate a lot, right? Like, I feel like, it, 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 and it's funny because I wanted to get your perspective on this because I know that you've actually been there. And I know that within you being there, it had changed your art because the the piece that you did when you got back about like our our ancestors from there looking upon us now like yo you know what I mean like yeah I felt that so but and also why I need to get probably want to look into my ancestry right or need to uh, I feel like there is this because like here's the thing like it's hard for like I don't like the term to be identified as the term African American, right? I, I just think that's a PC way of yeah, trying to address all black people because, yeah. like, I feel like African American is people who've migrated here from Africa. Yeah, like, you know what I mean. Yeah, like I make the example of what do you call a white South African? Is exactly. he is he, he African American? Like, and technically he, he is. Yeah, he's more <laughs> African American than I am. Right. Like, I'm black. Uh, but, but like within our interactions of African Americans and then black people, like there's this, is there a divide or I I feel like sometimes there is like, not not necessarily like there is like, oh, we all fuck with no Africans, Mm -hmm. but like culturally we do interact in this space differently because I think we, we as black Americans carried a little different baggage than somebody who knows or mm-hmm. like, you know what I mean? At least two, three generations 
where they from. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, is is that the real, like, it's not that we don't fuck with each other. It's just like, yo, we see things differently and like, oh, we, we really want to fuck with each other, but we just don't know how. Is that is that what it is? I'm gonna t- it's okay. So this is and this is one this is the main reason why I decided to go to Nigeria to start the research as opposed to just interviewing Nigerians here. Nigerians here. So um just like just like us, anybody who comes here is not immune to the culture of the destruction of the black image and the black and black bodies. Like this is an American culture. Our, co- our country was literally like built on like part of part of part of how this country was built had to do with the expense and and uh, kind of like how expendable the black like black image and the black body was. All right. And then it, it, just, it just translated when it wasn't as overt. It translated into the legacy and and like the, the image and identity of that as well. So it's the thing that has us not trusting black people. We don't know on site when we see them. If, if it's dark outside, you know, it's, it's, it's connected to that. And we this and it's another black American to another one. One black yeah. American to another one. It, it comes from that. It comes from us thinking that, like, you know, shit, just, just from the, the visuals that we see constantly that that brother may steal my, my whip if I leave that shit open like that. Or that sister probably don't want me for nothing but my money. <laughs> or that child probably won't pass that class. Because you know it's it's all all that stuff. We're not immune to it. So somebody who comes from another country is not immune to it. Now, one of the mm. things I think is is kind of wild about it is imagine coming from another country where you know you you do have all this pride because like in our country, you know here <clears throat> when it comes to building our identity and building our self esteem, we're we're going upward. We have to we have to um, reprogram our, ourselves. We have to reprogram ourselves and and kind of uh, do away with a lot of things that, that we have learned about ourselves. It's even whether it's subliminal or it's something that was directly told to us. When it comes to us building ourselves up, we have to say, oh, no, that was wrong. That was a contradiction. Let me transform that contradiction. Mm. Black people from other countries, mainly African, we talk about African, you think about black people from African countries, they come from a place where everybody looks like them. The people in charge look like them. The people in power look like them. The people who they want to be look like them. So they already had pride, and they come from a place that loves people who look like them. Like it's just, they, they're proud to be who they are. It's connected to their identity. They saw themselves as something as that was of worth, not having to prove to themselves like we do all the time. Mm. So when they come here with all that pride. And they're automatically associated with the negative image that our country jams down everybody's throat daily. I, I mean, I don't blame them for wanting to immediately distance themselves from that. It's like, no, I'm not, I'm not that. I'm mm-hmm. I'm not Jerry. Hold on, like I'm different, blah, blah, blah. And so mm-hmm. I think a lot of times it's it's not a thing that is done on purpose because they came here thinking like I'm not trying to be like you. Cause I, I just think it's something that happens when you, you get here and just like association is an, is a major thing. You show up and you like, let me, let me distance myself from that type of idea. And it's, it's a tough thing because a lot of weird things can happen. And, and that shit is a spectrum in and of itself. Cause you have some that, you know, whose parents had to come here and find a way to separate themselves. And then they had to teach their kids. Like, listen, you are this, you are this. You are not this. Don't let me catch you doing this. You know, mm. that kind of thing. Because it's like, you you know, this is where we come from. This is what you are here to do. This is why I came here. This is what I brought you here to do. This is the kind of life you're going to have. You're not going to get caught up in this mess that they be caught up in. And so that affects people differently. And so that's where I think when it comes with some of the riffs, that's where I think that shit comes from. Because like on the other end, I've had black folks who, who claim to not like Africans because Africans, quote unquote, think that they're better than us or yeah, think yeah, yeah, this, this, yeah. And, this. and I honestly find that to also be connected with 
their sense of self and and our lack of sense of self starting out is that they grew up being told what they are and all the great things they are. We grew up being told what we're not, what we won't be able to do, and we have a chip on our shoulder about that. And so when we see somebody who just doesn't even understand that life of being told that dumb shit, yeah, it, just, yeah. it looks totally different. It's like, look at this brother right here thinking he... You know what I'm saying? Because that's what it looks like. Hold on. You look like me. Who, who does but this nigga is, think he is? I'm telling you. It's, it's in there. It's in there. And I've seen it. And, yeah, that, and no, my, whole, you. my whole thing is like, that's that's not on them that you feel that way. That's not their fault. Get yours. It's the same shit like, like, like in grad school. When people see us shining, bro, like it was, you you can bet they may not have said it to your face, my G, but it was, you know, it, it was people that was hating, bro. I'm gonna tell you that right now. I, I know it. You could feel it when you walk in the room with people who used to talk to you all the time, <laughs> and now <laughs> now they kind of don't. It yeah. was you used to be down here with us, but like you moving in a way that's different. Where you we we all trying to figure it out, and you looking like you kind of know what you own. And there's a, it just affects people differently. So like that, I, I so that's why I call it an illusion. I call that rift an illusion because it it's not it don't have to be real. Like it, we make it real. We make it real in a sense to where it just comes from not knowing. We don't understand each other at times, and, and you know it just it just moves that way. Because I, I could guarantee a lot of people who have all this stuff to say about Africans and and and, and black folks not getting the, not getting along or whatever. More, more often than not, they probably don't have any African friends. And that, that's just kind of how that goes, bro. Because, like, people, you get to know somebody, that, that whole narrative changes, bro. But anyway, but that's that's what I have to say about folks who live here. But uh, when I was when I was out there, bro, in, in, in Nigeria and in Sudan, bro, like, they, it was all love. And, and they, they want to see us. They yeah. want to see, like, in all their newspapers... The yeah. newspaper is, is they're covering what black people are doing all around the world. There's only only a bit of it has to like there's whole sections like that have to do with what black folks are doing everywhere in the world. They are keeping up with us, my G. Like when when I went out there, uh, Venus was playing. Um, I forgot what tournament it was, but Venus. You no, know, it don't matter who she played. You know, you know it's yeah. funny. Whenever Serena's playing, nobody knows who she played against. <laughs> <laughs> nobody give a fuck. Nobody give yeah. a fuck about who she played against. Yeah. Everybody's talking about Serena. Nobody even give a fuck if she played against her sister, nigga. Like no. you know, <laughs> Serena. And this, was her, and this was her sister that was up. So they had they had <laughs> Venus. They had Venus on the front page of the, of the newspaper, bro. This this and this the Nigerian newspaper. Yeah, and is and they had Venus on the front, and they had other brothers from other places who were doing shit in other places. Just, they just keeping up with black folks everywhere. So it's, I believe there's there's a lot more uh, interconnectivity and in, in interest, yeah, that, than we actually know. And it you get a you get a different sense of um, what it feels like to be like the majority in a sense. Cause like I, I've stopped calling myself a, not, a minority after having been out there because I've, I, I find myself connected with folks in other places. Now I find myself connected when, when I, when I was the majority out there, I, I took that back. With, I brought that back with me. I brought that feeling back with me to where I don't feel like, uh, cause like the whole, my, the idea of being a minority just sounds like, you're going to lose if shit goes south. This is what it just feels like off the rip before anything happens. It feels like, hey, you know you're already losing, right? And yeah. so I kind of like lost that idea just from being out there because I felt connected with them. They were like, yeah, we, we're we thinking about y'all all the time. And that was just wild to me, bro. I'm like, damn. Because I think one of the, one of the issues uh, I used to have was the idea of like feeling – alone at times, like feeling like outnumbered or like kind of like powerless in a way that, you know, you always feel, cause I've, I've been the black dude in the room a lot of times, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And so I, I, I've never felt powerless in being the black dude in the room, but like being alone was just like a thing yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah. It, was just, you know, it was just normal to me. 
And so what they were telling me is just like, nah, bro, you are this is you're never alone. And I still talk to uh to my Nigerian family uh now. Like I talk to them every week. Yeah. And that's... it's it, it's just it's just good to get connected. Yeah, that's dope. That's dope. Yo, man, because that, and, 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 that's interesting you say that, man. I'm glad to hear that because, like, I've seen that change in your work of, like, especially that the, the mural you painted for um, for the graduate thesis that was, uh, you know, our ancestors looking up on us. Yeah. You know, but, but you know, hey, come home. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, hey, we here, baby. Like, hey. Yeah. What's up? Yeah. That's, we, that's, that's, that's how it was, bro. Yeah, man. That's dope. That's dope. But shit, man. We're going to have to wrap it up. You know what that's I mean? Yeah. I, 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 uh, but that was, I'm glad we wrapped it up on that note, man. We do need to come together. Like, uh, yo, I hit up my man OD. Uh, yeah. planning on getting him on here, you know what I'm saying? Because he's cool. act, uh, OD, if I'm not mistaken, is Nigerian, right? He is, yeah, 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 yeah. you know what I'm saying? I want to get some of his perspective, mm-hmm. you know. Um, uh, but yeah, man, so we're gonna wrap it up before we get out of here, yes, sir. Go ahead and uh. Tell the people what you're working on and where they can find you. Okay. I know, man. I've, you know, you've been in all kind of articles written up on you. Uh, you know, I tell people where they that. can find you. Tell, tell the people what you got coming up next. Any okay. exhibitions? Yeah. Anything like that? Okay. So um, <laughs> you can find. So my website is spencerevansart.com, and uh, my Instagram is spencerevans underscore art. And so you can find it. I, I post on that, uh, you know, a few times a week and anything that's coming up um, in the career, anything that's coming up uh, regarding a show or an article, I post on that pretty quickly. Uh, I have uh, my website. I put things on there periodically, but the the Instagram, you're going to get things pretty much in real time. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of gearing up. I'm building up for a, uh, a show that is opening uh, January, not January, July 13th. Uh, and that's, uh, so this next summer, July 13th, and that's going to be in Houston. First, first, first show, first legitimate show in Houston. And uh, it's, it's with myself and a couple other brothers. It's called uh, Three the Hard Way. And uh, it, it should be it should be a pretty live show, man. So I'm I'm trying to you know me being competitive. I gotta I gotta they cool brothers, but I gotta I gotta blow them out the water. So I got some some stuff in the works, uh, some stuff in the works, man, for that. And uh, so that that's what I'm in. I'm, I'm on the drawing board with that. I got a few things that that I started, and um, man, I'm 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 kind of formulating that that plan now. And I'm also teaching three courses at a uh, university of uh, Texas at Arlington right now. So that is also, you know, taking up a lot of that time, but you know, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. So everything, everything is good, man. I'm just hoping to keep walking in my purpose, man. And, and, and reaching the next form. Gee, I got, I'm, I'm changing forms on, on boys every chance I get. So I'm trying to reach the next form to, to uh, handle the next situation I'm in. And, uh, and beast that so that I can get to the next one. Dope, man. That's dope to hear, man. I'm fucking with you. And if I, you said it's in, in July? Yeah. Yeah, man, I'm going to try to make it down there, man, on some real shit. Like, That's come so fuck bad. with you. That's so um, bad. But yeah, man, so shout out to my man Spencer for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having um, me. Here. I got to come up with a tagline. This is early in, the, in, in my <laughs> career, so. Yeah, I'll come up with her too. But this has been the Four Color Man podcast yes, with sir. your host Terry Blues, and we out. All right.